Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to teach you about monitoring gastric residual volumes. By the end of the video, you should be able to define gastric residual volume, or GRV, identify the limitations of monitoring GRVs, and recite current recommendations for monitoring GRVs. If you find this information useful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. A gastric residual volume, or GRV, is the amount of gastric contents found in the stomach at a single point in time. It is obtained by withdrawing those contents using a catheter tip syringe. The clinician connects the feeding tube to a catheter tip syringe with the plunger in place and then pulls on the plunger to extract whatever is in the stomach. This is repeated until little to no contents are produced and then the total volume of the extracted contents is measured in milliliters. If it is determined to be a safe amount, the contents are reinserted and the tube feeding continues. If it is determined to be an unsafe amount, the contents are discarded and the tube feeding is held until the GRV decreases to a level that is deemed safe to resume. The goal of monitoring GRVs is to detect feeding intolerance and as a result, prevent vomiting, regurgitation, aspiration of gastric contents, and the development of aspiration pneumonia. Monitoring of GRVs is a widespread phenomenon in the acute care setting, and it is almost exclusively performed by nursing staff. In the making of this video, I was unable to uncover any recent data on the monitoring of GRVs in the United States. However, I was able to find a 2013 National Survey of Critical Care Nurses. In that survey, 2,298 nurses were asked various questions about their use of GRVs. 97.1% reported checking GRVs to monitor for feeding intolerance, and 80% reported measuring GRVs every four hours. The survey also asked the nurses about the threshold they use for stopping the tube feedings, and their responses varied tremendously. 24.9% reported holding feeds for a GRV of 150 ml or less. 36.5% reported holding feeds for a GRV greater than 200 ml. 24% reported holding feeds for a GRV greater than 250 ml. And only 12.6% reported holding feeds for a GRV greater than 500 ml. So, this survey revealed that 1. Obtaining GRVs is a very common practice among nurses, and 2. There is a lack of agreement on what constitutes a significant GRV. Since the publication of that paper, organizations like the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, the Society for Critical Care Medicine, and the American College of Gastroenterology have published new recommendations for monitoring GRVs. For this reason, I am hopeful that their recommendations are being followed, and there is presently less variability for when tube feedings are being stopped. Yet based on my own professional experience, as well as the experience of other dietitians who provide enteral nutrition, it is still common for nurses to choose an arbitrary threshold even if there is a hospital policy in place. When that threshold is unnecessarily low, it is problematic because it contributes to overall decreased nutrient delivery. Decreased nutrient delivery increases risk for underfeeding and malnutrition, and malnutrition increases risk for loss of muscle mass, poor functional status, risk of infection, impaired wound healing, and longer length of hospital stay. We will see the recommendations from the organizations I have mentioned later in this lesson. 
But first, I want to spend time looking at the limitations of GRV. By doing so, it should help to give the current recommendations context. One issue with monitoring GRVs, and specifically striving for low measurements, is that the concept goes against normal physiological function of the stomach. In addition to being an organ that mixes and churns the food we eat, the stomach serves as a reservoir for chyme. So, the idea that the stomach should not be holding any residual while feeding is in progress, or even that a small amount is problematic and needs to be discarded, simply makes no sense. Are we ever concerned about the gastric residual of someone who just ate lunch? Of course not. Even if we were, we would reasonably expect to find the remnants of it in the stomach waiting to be released into the small intestine. Then we can also think about some of the factors that can affect the consistency of a GRV measurement. One example is the feeding tube diameter. Feeding tubes come in a wide range of sizes, and tubes with a large diameter have been shown to produce a higher GRV than those with a small diameter. Another example is the feeding tube's position in the stomach. It is not uncommon for a peg tube to be placed high in the stomach above the air fluid level. When this is the case, extraction of gastric contents may not produce a concerning GRV. But if the same patient had an NG or OG tube that was positioned lower in the stomach, it would. Finally, the individual technique of the clinician can change the GRV. A slow and intermittent pull technique has been shown to produce a higher GRV than a pull technique that is fast and continuous. This suggests that two clinicians who attempt to obtain the same measurement may produce significantly different results. These are only a few of the factors that influence GRV measurement. Taken together, they suggest that it's not easy to produce consistent results across a wide range of patients. In other words, as it currently stands, the procedure for obtaining a GRV measurement lacks reliability. As a result, it is difficult to establish a standard that all patients should be measured against. Nevertheless, we can pretend for a moment that a GRV measurement has high reliability, meaning it always produces consistent results from patient to patient. In order for it to be useful in the detection of feeding intolerances and the prevention of aspiration and aspiration pneumonia, it must predict those events with a high degree of accuracy. So, we must ask the question, does monitoring GRVs lead to better patient outcomes? The current body of evidence suggests the answer to that question is no. Several studies over the past 15 years have found that elimination of GRV monitoring is not associated with risk of aspiration or aspiration pneumonia. Furthermore, Elimination of GRV monitoring is not associated with a longer duration of mechanical ventilation, a longer ICU length of stay, or mortality. Some of these studies have even looked at nutrient delivery and have found that elimination of routine GRV monitoring results in increased delivery of calories and protein. As such, it appears that not monitoring GRV leads to no additional risk for the patient and may contribute to a better nutritional status. That brings us to the current guidelines from organizations in the United States. In a joint publication from 2016, the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition and the Society for Critical Care Medicine recommend against the routine monitoring of GRV for ICU patients receiving enteral nutrition. 
understanding that many medical institutions would be hesitant to adopt this practice, they also recommend that if GRVs are routinely measured, Holding tube feedings for a GRV less than 500 mLs should be avoided as long as there are no other signs of feeding intolerance. Signs of feeding intolerance include vomiting, abdominal distension, reduced passage of flatus or stool, and an abnormal abdominal x-ray. The American College of Gastroenterology also has a 2016 clinical guideline that recommends against the routine monitoring of GRV. That guideline goes a step further and makes the recommendation for all hospitalized patients receiving enteral nutrition, not just those in the ICU. In the end, The gastric residual volume is a tool for monitoring feeding tolerance that lacks the consistency and accuracy to make it worth using in all patients receiving enteral nutrition. Since most nurses have been trained to monitor them routinely, implementing a policy that abandons GRVs entirely remains difficult to achieve. If elimination in your facility is not feasible, Establishing a policy with specific parameters for monitoring GRVs might be. At the facility where I practice, GRVs are obtained every 4 hours and the tube feeding is only held for residuals greater than 500 mLs. Any patient with a GRV greater than 500 mLs is reassessed by a registered dietitian and is considered for a standing prokinetic agent a post-pyloric feeding tube, and or a lower feeding rate. If the GRV is between 250 and 500 mLs, 250 mLs are reinserted and the rest is discarded. The tube feeding is continued and the patient is considered for a prokinetic agent. Finally, if the GRV is less than 250 mLs, All of it is reinserted and the tube feeding is continued with no additional changes. Reinserting the GRV is important because the residual contains calories, protein, fluid, and electrolytes. Once the GRV is reinserted, at least 20 mLs of water should be flushed to minimize the risk of clogging the feeding tube. Education and reinforcement of this policy is often necessary to avoid unnecessary holding of enteral nutrition. With clinicians who are hesitant to adopt it, try to position the policy as one that benefits them by allowing for more time to complete other tasks, while also benefiting the patient by helping them to receive the nutrition he or she needs for healing. Here is a summary for this lesson. A gastric residual volume, or GRV, is the amount of gastric contents found in the stomach at a single point in time. To obtain a GRV, the clinician connects the feeding tube to a catheter tip syringe with the plunger in place, and then pulls on the plunger to extract whatever is in the stomach. The total volume gets measured in milliliters, and if it is determined to be a safe amount, the contents are reinserted and the tube feeding continues. If it is determined to be an unsafe amount, the contents will be discarded and the tube feeding is held until the GRV decreases to a level that is deemed safe to resume. This is a common practice among nurses in the acute care setting. However, there is a high amount of variability in what is considered to be a safe amount and an unsafe amount. This can lead to unnecessary holding of tube feeding, and therefore decreased nutrient delivery and increased risk for malnutrition. One issue with GRVs is that the procedure for obtaining a GRV measurement lacks reliability meaning it is difficult to establish consistency from patient to patient. Factors that have an effect on measurement include the feeding tube diameter, the position of the feeding tube in the stomach, 
and the technique of the individual clinician. Another issue is that the monitoring of GRVs does not necessarily lead to better patient outcomes. The current body of evidence suggests that elimination of GRV monitoring is not associated with risk of aspiration or aspiration pneumonia, nor does it have a significant impact on duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU length of stay, or mortality. It is for this reason that organizations like the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition and the Society for Critical Care Medicine recommend against the routine monitoring of GRVs for ICU patients receiving enteral nutrition. Knowing that many institutions would be hesitant to adopt this recommendation, these organizations also state that if GRVs are obtained, holding feeds for a GRV less than 500 mLs should be avoided as long as there are no other signs of feeding intolerance such as vomiting, abdominal distension, or the reduced passage of flatus or stool. Whether or not the elimination of GRV monitoring is embraced, there should always be an official policy in place for clinicians to follow. As part of this policy, there should be guidelines for reinserting residuals less than 500 mLs to avoid the wasting of valuable calories, protein, fluid, and electrolytes. Water should also be flushed after reinsertion to minimize the risk of clogging the feeding tube. Education and reinforcement of the policy need to be an ongoing process to ensure there is compliance. For any clinician who is hesitant to adapt the policy, it may be helpful to position it as something that will give them more time to dedicate to other tasks while also helping the patient receive the nutrition he or she needs for healing. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.